Okay, so picking back up where we left off, we want to now start to talk about the differences between personal property and real property. And another word that we're going to introduce here to the mix when we talk about real property is the word fixture. Fixture is real property. As we said, personal property, the primary characteristic, what do we say, the first thing you should look at to tell you whether something is personal or real property? Is it, is it movable, right? Does it, is it movable? If it has mobility, it's most likely going to be personal property. And that is very much true. Whereas the opposite of personal property are things called fixtures. Fixtures are anything that used to be personal property, but have been permanently attached and converted into real property. Remember, what did we say our definition was of permanently attached? Screwed, nailed. Nailed, glued. screwed, glued, or buried, in, buried the in the ground. Those are the four things. Nailed, screwed, glued, or buried in the ground are the things that we look for to determine if this is indeed permanently attached. So a fixture is just something that would otherwise be personal property that has now been permanently attached and converted into real property. Here is why this is an important distinction for us. We are in a real estate class. That means we are selling real property. The problem we run into though is when we go and we show real property to potential buyers, it's often full of personal property. And it's gonna be really important that we can clearly show that potential buyer what things they're purchasing and what things they are not purchasing. Do you think the buyer cares? what things are going to be included with the transaction. Absolutely. And do you think there's the potential to have major disagreements about some things that a seller doesn't think should be included in a transaction and a buyer does think should be included in the transaction? So it's our job to be able to explain to them in advance whether that thing is personal property or whether that thing is real property. Is that projector personal property or real property? That television that's hanging on the wall, is it personal property or real property? The furniture, is it personal property or real property? The refrigerator, is it going with the transaction or is it not? We need to be able to answer those kinds of questions and that's why this is such an important thing for us. This last bullet point is probably the most important one in the whole section. Because it doesn't do you any good to know whether something is a fixture without knowing what that means. That last bullet point tells you what that means. What it means to be a fixture is that it is included in the sale. It is included as part of the transaction. Another way to say that is fixtures convey, that word convey just means transfer, with the property. Fixtures are appurtenances, so they go with the property. Is everybody okay with that? So if I buy the property, I'm not only buying the land, I'm not only buying the building, but I'm buying anything that's also a fixture. Whereas personal property does not convey in a normal real estate transaction. Is everybody with me on that? Now remember, this is a free country. These rules only go as far as the two parties, buyer and seller, two parties in the transaction, want them to go. Can a buyer and seller get together and agree that the refrigerator is not going to be considered personal property, it's going to be considered a fixture? Can they agree yes. on that? Yes. yes. Absolutely. And where would they agree on that? Contract. In what document would they agree on that? Contract. In the contract in the sales contract between the two. Couldn't they just say, for purposes of this contract, we're gonna consider the, the refrigerator a fixture. Does that make sense? So obviously they can always redefine things, but here's why it's really important to know if it is a fixture or not a fixture. Most of the time your contracts are not gonna specify what the refrigerator is. So we need a system of determining is that a fixture or is it personal property? Because it's a fixture, what does that mean about it as it relates to the sale? Is it going to be part of the sale or is it not going to be part of the sale? It's going to be part of the sale, whereas if it's personal property, it is what? It's excluded. It's not going to be part of the sale. Is everybody with me on that? The other thing is, even if it is 
included or excluded, we can decide in the contract to do the opposite. So I'll give you a hint. Refrigerator is personal property. It just is. And the primary reason is, it is what? It's movable. Refrigerators are on wheels, folks. They just plug into the wall. They have wheels on the bottom of them. Uh, for those of you that don't know that, I don't want to see what yours looks like underneath it. Pull it out sometime. Get out a broom. I promise you it needs it. Okay? It's, it's movable. It's personal property. Do you think there are a lot of buyers who want that personal property when they buy a house? Yes. Absolutely. And they can do that. But to do that, they would have to specially put in the contract that they also want to buy the refrigerator. Because a sales contract by itself only includes things that are fixtures. And since the refrigerator is not a fixture, it's not included in the transaction. Does that make sense to everybody? So, let me ask this another way. If something is personal property, what am I doing to it by mentioning it in the contract? Am I excluding it from the contract or am I including it into the deal? Which am I doing if it's personal property? Including. I'm including it. By mentioning it, I'm including it. Is everybody with me on that? So if I mention the refrigerator in the contract, I'm not mentioning it to exclude it because it's already excluded. I'm mentioning it because I intend for it to be what? Sold. Included or added in to the transaction. Let's think about it from the opposite perspective. A chandelier. You think a chandelier is probably a fixture? Yes. 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 So do we need to say anything about it in the contract for that chandelier to be included in the transaction? No, no. no it's automatically included in the transaction. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Can we specially say something about it in, in the contract? Yes. Why? Why would we make special mention of that thing? We want if we want to what? <laughs> if we wanted to exclude it from the transaction. So you mention a fixture if you don't want it to convey. You mention personal property if you what? If you do want it to convey. I know what to think of that is, you only mention these things if you want to do the opposite of what they would ordinarily do on their own. Since the fixture ordinarily conveys, you only need to mention it if you want to what? Exclude it. If you want to exclude it. Is everybody okay with that? If, in other words, if you don't want it to be part of the sale, you would have to mention in the contract, because if you don't mention it, what is it? It stays. It stays. It's part of the transaction. It sells with the property. Is everybody good on that? Because it's a fixture. Whereas the refrigerator is personal property. It's not part of the sale. You mention it in the contract if you want to do what? Include it. You want to do the opposite of what it does naturally. So you, that's the way this is going to show up on a test for you guys. They're not going to make it so straightforward. They're just going to say something like, they're going to say, Catherine is a real estate broker affiliated with Keller Williams and Carey. And she drafts an offer to purchase and contract for her buyer client that she represents, making special mention of the television in the living room. What is the legal status of the television after the closing? Well, talk to me. A television, is that most likely to be personal property or real property? Personal. personal property. So what would that television do if her contract said nothing about it? Would it be part of the transaction or would it not be part of the transaction? It would not be. So if she drafted a contract making special mention of the television, why was she specially mentioning the television? Because she wanted to include it in the transaction. So then go back to the question, what's the legal status of the television after closing? Who does it belong to, the seller or the buyer? The buyer, because it was included in, by writing it into the contract. Does that make sense for everybody? Whereas the exact same question, I could say Catherine was drafting a contract making special mention of the dining room chandelier. What is the legal status of the chandelier after closing? Well, a chandelier is a fixture. So a chandelier would automatically be part of the transaction, automatically included, correct? Why would she specially mention the chandelier in the contract? She wants, to exclude, she wants to exclude it. She wants to do the opposite. So the legal status of the chandelier is going to be that it belongs to who? The seller or the buyer? It still belongs to the seller because it was excluded from the transaction. Is everybody okay with that? All right. 
So that, that's the importance of this topic, is to basically know what we're selling. What are we selling at any given time? So let's take that to the most extreme example. Let's talk about these things. I'm very familiar with these things where I came from in Eastern North Carolina. Manufactured houses. We call them trailers. Single wides, double wides. Triple wides if you fancy, right? A manufactured home, such as the one on the left, folks, is personal property. We'll say that one more time. A manufactured home is personal property. Here's why. It's a car. It has a title, like a car. It has a vehicle identification number, like a car. It is registered with the North Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles, like a car. Cars are what? Personal property. Personal property, and so are manufactured houses. They're on wheels. What do we say the primary characteristic is of personal property? It's movable. These things are personal property. Here's where that's going to present a problem for you. At some point in your career, you're going to go out and you're going to show a piece of property to somebody that has a double wide on it. And you're going to take them through the house, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to like it, and they're going to want to make an offer on it. And you write up that contract, and you make no special mention of anything on that contract. And you go to closing, and they pay for the property. So talk to me. Things that are fixtures conveyed just then, right? When we sold that property? They bought the property. They bought the land, but what did they not buy? The car that was parked on the land. It just so happened it was a big car with bedrooms and bathrooms in it. But it's still a car. And it didn't come with the sale because it's personal property. Did you just mess up? Yes. Big time. Big time. So you need to understand that these manufactured homes are personal property. Now, they can be converted into real property. It can be. And we're going to talk about what the steps are there to convert it. Is everybody good on the idea that they're personal property though? Now, let me compare that with modular houses. Modular houses are real property. They are not treated any differently in, in the eyes of the law than a site built or stick built house. Here's the reason. When that modular home comes in, yes, it comes in in pieces on the back of the truck, but what did they immediately do? Put it on a permanent what? Foundation. And being on that permanent foundation makes it real property. It makes it a fixture. So if you're selling a modular home, do you need to make any special mention of the, the structure itself? No, you don't, because it's going to be included. But if you're selling a manufactured home, do you need to make a special mention of it? Yes, you need to write in VIN, vehicle identification. I'm trying to condition myself away from saying VIN number. It's like saying ATM machine. You know, the N stands for number, right? It's not VIN number, that's vehicle identification, number, number. You don't need two Ns. I'm just trying to condition myself to say VIN, but it's very hard. It's like saying a hot water heater. There's no such thing. If you already had hot water, you would need to heat it up. It's just a water heater. And I have friends that live in Arizona. They actually have a water chiller. It gets so hot there in the summer that the water will scald you coming out of the tap on the cold side. And so they have to have a water, isn't that crazy? They have to have a chiller because the water coming out of the ground is like 120 degrees uh, on the cold side. Um, but with modular homes, with modular homes, they are fixtures, whereas manufactured homes are not. Now let's talk about converting that manufactured home from personal property into real property. If you want to convert that manufactured home from personal property into real property, three things. The most important of which is put it on a permanent foundation. So it needs to be put on a permanent foundation. It needs to you need to remove the wheels and axles and the towing hitch from the front. And then you need to turn the title in with the Department of Motor Vehicles. Notify the Department of Motor Vehicles this is no longer a car. Okay? It's no longer mobile. If you do those three things, then it does become real property. It becomes a fixture because now it's permanently attached. As a broker though, as a real estate broker, 
if you're helping somebody draft a contract and you know this is a manufactured home, the safest thing to do is to just write it in to the contract and say, we include this manufactured home. That has you covered. Does that make sense for everybody? Write it in and make sure you're covered. Don't ever sell a manufactured home without including it in the contract because it may still be considered personal property. Are you able to make it personal property again after it's been... You can, just, yeah, so in theory, any fixture can, uh, again, be what we call severed from the property or cut away from the property. So if you, in theory, if you were to put the wheels back under it and take it off the foundation and move it, yeah, you can convert it back to personal property. Yep, just like a deck. So think of a deck, for example. When a deck arrives and it's just lumber on the back of a truck or a trailer, it's what kind of property? Personal, personal property. And then we build the deck, attach it to the house, bury the post in the ground, it becomes what? real property. 15 years later we need to replace the deck so we tear all that same lumber back up and throw it in the back of a trailer. What kind of property is it now? It's personal again so you can make that change. It's the connection to the property that matters. Okay? Everybody good here? All right. So manufactured homes are what kind of property? Personal. Personal property. Good. Good. The other thing to remember about manufactured homes is they do not meet your local building codes. All right. They don't meet your local building codes. I'm fighting with my, I'm going to change the batteries in this thing real quick. See if that's the problem. If I have any. Oh, those are the boys. Manufactured homes are not built to, be, to meet your local building codes. Um, they are built to meet HUD standards in a factory. Whereas modular homes are built to meet your local building codes. Which you think is going to be stricter? The HUD codes in a factory somewhere for the manufactured homes or your local building codes? Which ones are going to be stricter? Your local building codes. Much more strict. So if you're buying a modular home, that home has to be constructed. Even though it's being built in a factory somewhere, it's being constructed according to the building codes for wherever it's going to be assembled, wherever it's going to be located. Okay? Good. Oh, I'm sorry. Does that affect if you can turn it to real property when, when you are um, making it a, not a vehicle anymore, you're making it into real property? Does that, does that affect... Um, that at all, like, would you have to add things to it, or? Not sure what you're asking I'm, me I'm trying to put it into, into terms. So, since it's a vehicle and you don't have to do it to building standards as if they build it there on the foundation, would you have to change anything other than like the axis and the wheels or anything to convert it into real property? No. No, you would simply, you, you don't, to convert it to real property, you go through those three steps. You put it on a permanent foundation, you remove the wheels and axles, and you remove the tow hitch and turn the title in. It's still not going to meet your local building codes. In fact, it never will meet your local building codes. It's impossible to make it meet your local building codes. What does that mean? What does that mean? Um, like, what does that mean for the property that it doesn't meet the codes? So what is the purpose of a building code, you think? Versus safety. Safety. So what does that tell you about the relative safety of a manufactured home versus a home that does meet your local building codes? It's not, the same. not nearly so. Okay. Not nearly as safe. They are simply not built to the same standards that either site built construction or modular built construction is. Yes. So as far as paperwork is concerned, though, it wouldn't, like it wouldn't affect anything. It doesn't affect anything. The only real thing, the long term effect from it being a manufactured home, is they depreciate much like vehicles do. Um, whereas we generally don't think of real property homes. We don't generally think of site built homes or modular homes as depreciating in value over time. We do think of a manufactured home as depreciating in value over time. At some point in time, they reach a point where the, the physical structure is worthless um, as far as market value goes. Yeah, that's really the main difference. Okay? Plants can also come as either real property or personal property. A plant can be real property, a plant can be personal property. Remember, we said the primary thing that makes a difference is if, if it's real property or personal property is whether it is what? 
movable. Same thing is true with plants. The first question to ask yourself is, is the plant movable? If it's in a planter, what kind of property is it? Personal. It's personal property. So the only kinds of plants we need to concern ourselves with are ones that are buried in the ground. Plants that are buried in the ground can either be real property or personal property. Here's what's going to determine if they're real property or personal property. If they do not require annual cultivation, like this tree. Cultivation means replanting. So annual cultivation means we have to replant the thing year after year after year. If it comes back on its own year after year after year, or it's a perennial, if you like to use the, the flower terminology. If it's a perennial plant that comes back year after year without having to be replanted, it is going to be considered a fixture. It is real property. So that tree, for example, right there, is real property. Give me, some, give me examples of other plants that you would routinely find on a property that would be considered real property. Things that come back year after year. Bushes. Any kind of tree that's planted in the ground, shrubbery, rose bushes, all those kinds of things. You know, green plants mostly, things like rye, you know, you don't need no plant names, but anything that comes back year after year versus things that require annual cultivation. Now, things that require annual cultivation mostly are going to be things like this, crops crops or any plant that requires annual cultivation, so it has to be replanted when? Every year, are going to be considered personal property of whoever planted them. So, if a tenant plants them, whose property are they? The tenant's property. If the owner of a property plants them and then sells the property, whose property are they? The original owners, the one who planted them. This is important. Think about if you're selling farmland. Remember, you're getting a real estate license to sell, lease, list, exchange, auction, any of those things, any piece of real estate anywhere in the state of North Carolina. Is that going to include farmland? Sure. So if you're selling a farm and there are crops in the ground, who do the crops belong to after closing? They still belong to the seller. They don't belong to the new owner. Do the trees that are on the property belong to the new owner? Yes. But the crops don't. And here's the kicker with something like this. Not only do they still belong to the old owner, you have to give them access to the property to come back in there and cultivate them and harvest them. So, talk to me about a way around that. When you hear, first of all, when you hear that, does that sound like a mess? Does that sound like a huge mess? You just sold a farm, but this crop of tobacco that's sitting in the field still belongs to the seller, not the buyer. Try explaining that to them. Oh, and by the way, not only does that crop not belong to you, you have to let them come on your property for the next three months while it continues to grow and, they continue, and so they can harvest it. How is that conversation going to go with the buyer? Poorly, right? It's going badly. Now is your time to put yourself in the mode of a real estate broker. How do you fix it? How do you game plan around that? How do you do that so that you don't end up with such a mess? What are some options? Wait. Delay till when? Until it's harvested. Don't close until it's harvested. That's one plan. What else? Put it on the contract. Put what in the contract? That the, the, the cross came be a part of the transaction. So in other words, we're going to buy the property and we're going to buy the crops. Right. So we could include the crops. Is that a, is that a reasonable solution as well? Yes. I think either one of those works great. Delay the closing. Let's not close until after the thing's harvested. Or let's purchase the crops right along with the property. Is everybody with me on that? Because if you don't, that crop's going to still belong. Here's the other thing. It's even worse on a lease. Notice I said that personal property belongs to whoever planted it. What if you have a tenant farmer in there and their lease expires in June? 
How long is that crop going to be in the ground? Also. September? October? And so now you have somebody who's no longer paying you rent because their lease is expired, but what do you have to do with their crop? Leave it there and let them continue to what? Come back on the property, maintain it, and harvest it. You're a moron if you lease farmland that way. So when should your leases expire if you're leasing farmland? Whenever the crops are out of the field. December, for example. Does that, are you following that mindset? So you need to understand what impact that would have on a transaction. So, with plants, what would make a plant real property? What makes it real property? You don't have to what? Cultivate it annually. So it comes back year after year on its own, and it's understood it's buried in the ground. Because if it's not buried in the ground, it's definitely personal property. Whereas anything not buried in the ground, or anything that is buried in the ground but requires annual cultivation, is going to be considered what? Personal, personal property. Are we all good on those distinctions? Everybody good with that? Okay, good. We can take anything away or connect anything to the property. Annexation is taking personal property and making it into real property. Annexation just means attachment. That's all it means. We're attaching stuff to the property. Severance means you're cutting it away from the property. So, for example, this door, when it was delivered to the property, was it real property or personal property? Personal. personal. When it was hung here, that was annexation. That converted it from real, I mean from personal into real. Could we convert it back from real back into personal? Yeah, we could sever it. We could take it down. Does that make sense for everybody? That's just what those two words mean there. Now, your book tells you to do this a different way. I have my own method, and I think it works a little better, of determining if something is a fixture. This is what your, your book says you need to look at. The intent, the relationship, the method, the, and they're not wrong. But I like my method better because it's shorter. Before we even go there, though, let me point out something to you. When you're trying to decide something is a fixture, the first place you're going to look is not to ask questions or even look at the thing. The first place you're going to look is the contract. Because is it possible that the contract may already specifically mention the thing you're trying to have an argument about anyway? You're sitting here trying to figure out if this projector is a fixture. Is it possible that the contract already says, well, the projector is going to be considered a fixture? Is it possible that that's in there? So the first place you're going to look in any transaction when you're trying to determine if something is a fixture is where? Is always at the contract. If the contract says it's a fixture, it's a fixture. Stop right there. See, I and I have to point that out to you because this is one of those things that real people in the business get wrong all the time. All the time. Turn in the back of your book. I'm going to show you what I mean. The back of your binder here. All the way at the very back, you have um, an exclusive right to sell listing, you have a buyer agency agreement, and then you have the offer to purchase and contract for North Carolina. It's the last thing in the whole book back there. It's 13 pages long. Let me know when you get there. It says offer to purchase and contract. Page, and it should be page 1 of 13 down at the bottom. Does everybody see where I am? Yeah. With me? Yeah. I want to show you something. So this is the standard contract that we use if you're a realtor in North Carolina. If you're a realtor in North Carolina, by the way, you're not getting a license to be a realtor. The Realtors is a trade organization. It's a, it's a, it's a union. You can join it or not join it. You can decide to pay them or not pay them. You're not getting a license to be a realtor. You're getting a license to be a real estate broker. But if you want to use these forms, you've got to be a what? A realtor, because it's their form. Okay? Look over on page, let's see, page three of this contract. You see at the bottom of page three, that whole section down there where it says fixtures and exclusions? Does everybody see where I'm looking at? Yep. 
It says, unless specified below, the following items, including all related equipment and remote control devices, if any, are deemed what? Fixtures. Fixtures. Look at how long that list is. So you may be sitting there having an argument with somebody going, I'm telling you the stove is not a fixture because it just plugs into the wall. It's not attached. And that might all be true, except if you look down at the second bullet point on this thing, what does it say? All, all stoves, ranges, ovens, and built-in appliances are going to be considered what? Fixtures. Fixtures. So that's what I mean. That's all I wanted to show you that. That's what I mean when I say the best place to refer to anytime you're trying to decide in a specific transaction if something is a fixture, the best place to refer is always the contract that the two parties have already agreed to. Because there's a decent chance that it may already mention the thing you're arguing about. Is, that, is everybody okay with that? That's real world advice. Now, for test taking purposes, they're going to want you to be able to sort through things that aren't mentioned in the contract. To decide if something is a fixture based on its legal status. Because I'm going to tell you the truth, a stove, an electric one, an electric range is not legally a fixture. It's personal property. It just plugs into the wall. But that contract calls it a what? A fixture. So if you use that contract, then for the purposes of that deal, it's going to be considered what? It's a fixture. It's a fixture. It's real property. It's real property. It's part of the deal because that contract says it is, but that's only in play when that contract is used. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes, sir, Ben. Uh, okay, so older houses have like an oil furnace, mm -hmm. kind of thing, but that it's not technically, uh, you know, it's not technically nailed to the property because it's, it can be removed. Would that be considered? Where is the furnace? It's, it's on the property, but it's not technically connected to the property. Like, it's just... The lines are connected, but other than that, it's just... You're talking about the tank? Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the tank. Because the furnace would be inside the property. The furnace would be connected inside the property. And the tank itself might not be a fixture if it's just sitting on top of the ground. If it's just sitting on top of the ground, it may not be. It might not be. And you get it, and that's why you wouldn't want to leave that up for debate. If you were selling that kind of property, it would be the best thing to do. Just go ahead in the contract and specify the tank is what? It's a fixture. For this purpose of this contract, it's a fixture. But on the test, they're going to want you to identify whether things are a fixture that are not mentioned in the contract. And that's where we get into this, they call it the total circumstances test in the book. I'm telling you that's too complex. If you can ask yourself two questions, you can determine if something is a fixture or not. Now remember, I can't stress this enough, you only apply this test if you've already looked at the contract first. If you look at the contract first and it specifies, well, that thing's a fixture, then do you need to worry about the test? No, because the contract says it's a fixture. You only apply the test if you've looked and the contract says nothing about the thing. So we want to know, Catherine wants to know if the blinds are a fixture. Where's the first place she goes to look? at the contract. She reads the whole contract that says nothing about blinds. Now she needs a test. She needs a, a way of determining if those blinds are a fixture. Is everybody okay with that so far? Question one, is it permanently attached? That is the first question to ask yourself about this thing. Is it permanently attached? And what do we say permanently attached meant? Nailed, screwed, glued, or buried in the ground. Is it one of those things? If you get a yes to that, we still don't know if it's a fixture. You've got to go to question two. If you get a no, it's what? Personal. It's personal property. If you get a no, if it's not permanently attached, it's automatically personal property. So, number one, is it permanently attached? Assuming you get a yes to that question, then you go to question number two. Was it attached by the owner of the property? Who else could it have been attached by? Well, that's going to count the same as owner. So, an, an owner of the property. Who else? A tenant. That's the one we're looking for. That's the danger zone. Because if it was attached by a tenant, folks, it doesn't matter that it's permanently attached. Whose property is it? 
It's the tenant's personal property. That's why that question is there. So you ask yourself two questions. Number one, is it permanently attached? So if I was trying to determine, if I was trying to determine, for example, if this countertop, this counter, this cabinet, was a fixture, first question I ask myself is, is it permanently attached? What's the answer to that yes. question? Yes. Yes. Do I need to ask the second question? Yes, because who occupies this property? And who am I? Am I the owner or am I a tenant? I'm a tenant. And if there's a tenant in the property, isn't there at least a decent chance that that thing was attached by the tenant? And if it was attached by the tenant, is it a fixture or is it personal property? It's personal property. So I would have to ask the question, who attached the cabinet? We don't know yet. The answer in this case is <laughs> the answer in this case is the landlord attached the cabinet. So what does that make it? Personal. Uh, real property. Real property. Real property. The landlord attached it makes it real property. Apply the same test to this board. Is it permanently attached? Yes. Yes. Was it permanently attached by the owner of the real property? No. I own that board. Who am I? Tenant. Whose property is it? Personal. My personal property. So if somebody were buying the building, would the board be theirs as a result of buying the building? No. 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 It belongs to the tenant. As long as the tenant can remove it before, by the time their lease expires and repair any damage as a result of moving it, then it's personal property. Yes, ma'am, Jackie. Yeah. Trade fixtures? Trade fixtures, they, see that's the silliest definition in the whole book. Any fixture, atta anything attached by a tenant belongs to the tenant. Whether it's a trade fixture or whether it's a ceiling fan, if it was attached by a tenant, it belongs to the tenant. Does that make sense? And so anytime you're selling a property that's occupied by who? A tenant, you better start asking, what did they attach? I'll give you an example. Remember we said Kevin was buying that house from Bryson earlier? But it had been a lease it had been leased to Aaliyah. You remember our discussion earlier? Well Kevin buys the house from Bryson. And he walks through one time looking at the house and like, yeah, this is in good shape. It's got ceiling fans in all the bedrooms, looks nice. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask to install those ceiling fans though. Because the truth is Aaliyah moved in and put ceiling fans in all those bedrooms. And who is she? A tenant. 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 So when she moves out, can she remove the ceiling fans yes. and put the property back in its original condition? Yes. Because the ceiling fans were not part of the transaction because they weren't Bryson's to sell in the first place. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. So that's what I mean by the two-step process here is, number one, is it permanently attached? And then number two, was it attached by the owner of the property? Those are the two big questions you need to ask yourself when you're trying to determine if something is a fixture. Yes, sir. Um, so if, they, if the tenant like added it and they were going, their thing expired and they were just going to leave and they decided to leave that, would you have to have some type of paperwork to... If they abandon it, then it becomes property of the, the <coughs> owner. It becomes real property as soon as it's abandoned by the tenant. All right. So if the tenant moves out, leaves the ceiling fans up, they become the property of the, the owner. That's a good question, too. Yes, ma'am, Lee. If, um, if the contract was signed and the person who bought it thought wasn't told that it wasn't, uh, um, it wasn't their property, what happens then? Do they have to pay the person, the tenant, for instance, for the property? or? No, because the tenant's going to take the property with them when they move out. Sure, they can. It's up to the tenant. They certainly can. My guess is the landlord would say, no, I'm not willing to buy it from you, banking on the fact that you would just what? You would leave it anyway. But yeah, it's, your, it's yours. It belongs to the tenant, so they can do whatever they want to with it. Just remember, it is their obligation to put the property back in its original condition. So when I move out, if I move out of this space, seven years in this lease, end, <laughs> if I move out of this space, can I take that board down? Yes. yes. What do I have to do? Patch the holes in the wall. Repair any damage 
that results from my installation. If you want it. If I want it. If I want it, because I choose to leave it there. Mm -hmm. Sure. And it will become the property of the, the, the owner of the property. The landlord. Yes, ma'am. If the tenant leaves, they've abandoned the property and it becomes the property of the owner, the landlord, whoever the landlord is at that point in time. Yes, ma'am, Jackie. So if you leave it there, then can you, like if you're a tenant, can you sell the property and then the grounds to not give your deposit back? Because you didn't leave it as the original. Correct. They could charge me for the cost of removing it if that's what they wanted to do because your obligation as a tenant is always to put the property back in what? And the original condition. Sure. Yes, sir. So the said that you were to abandon the board whenever you leave, but the owner does not want the board. He ends up taking it down, but then he's got the holes to patch up. You know, say that it's a bigger issue, you know, for a bigger item, another location. <coughs> so who's going to pay? Well, that was sort of, yeah, that was sort of Jackie's question. Can I be held? Can the tenant be held liable for the cost of putting the property back? The answer is yes, they can. So a much bigger example than a board. Let's say I'm operating a restaurant in a leased premises and I install a bar. Um, that's a much bigger change in the property. And when I leave, I don't take the bar out and the next tenant doesn't want the bar and so the landlord has to spend money to remove it and put the property back and they could certainly charge the tenant for that expense. Because the tenant always has an obligation to leave the property in the same condition. Yes, ma'am. Sure, and contracts always trump over any sort of rules. The thing you need to understand about all these rules is the rules are only in place for when there is no agreement, right? That, that the idea that the tenant has to leave it the same is a basic legal idea. But if the tenant and landlord have agreed in advance, you don't have to take any of it out, you don't have to do anything, you can leave it exactly as it is and we won't hold you responsible, then great. Then great, if they've agreed to that in the contract. That's the whole advantage of being very clear in a contract up front about what the expectations are. So you're not left to that sort of leaving it up in the air experience. Are we all good on this idea? Just as a, a quick test, a projector. And I'll do you the favor of telling you I installed it. Personal property. What about question number one? Is it permanently attached? Yes. yes. Is it now? But it's nailed. No, it's not. It's not screwed. Well, we were assuming that it was permanently attached. You made an assumption. Yeah. Oh. It is not. It is no more attached than that ceiling tile right there it is. That's, that's a clever... Uh, that's a clever thing on your part, understanding that you designed that the way that you can. It's just plug a ceiling tile. That. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's just a ceiling tile. Well, you're the there tenant, so. It would be personal property no matter what. But how about if you had that in somebody's basement that was selling their house? Could you make a mistake on something like that and think, oh, that's permanently attached? Uh huh. And would you be wrong? You would be because. It's not permanently attached to the property. Oh yeah, it's permanently attached to that plate, but that plate has no attachment to the property. It is not nailed, it is not screwed, it is not glued, and it is not buried in the ground. It is just sitting in that track. That's all it is. Most of the cases it's gonna be attached, like on the property, like the plate, mm -hmm. but not the equipment. Correct, the equipment so the, the, the television. Exactly. The equipment would be the personal property. But well, the let's talk about a television. How many of you have a television mounted on the wall? How many of you have ever hung one or watched one in your home? When you put that television on the wall, that bracket that you put it up with comes in how many pieces? Several. Several, right? Well, but generally two big pieces. One that you mount to the wall and then one that you mount on the back of the television. And how does the TV actually get on the wall? Home. You just hook it 
onto the bracket that's on the wall, right? So is the television permanently attached? No. 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 The bracket that's screwed into the wall is, so what's the fixture? The bracket. The bracket. The television's not, because the television is just hanging on the other bracket, which is hanging on the bracket. You, you see that? And so that's why my point is, you don't want to rely on those kinds of things. If you were walking through that house with a buyer and they say, well, I want this television, you don't want to go, mm -hmm, that's smart, I know, that's a fixture. What are you going to do to protect your client? Write the thing into what? The contract, because the contract is always the best place to make that kind of thing clear. Does that make sense for everybody? That's the way to protect your client. Don't rely on the fact that, oh yeah, that's definitely a fixture. If there's any question whatsoever, make sure it's clear in the contract that this thing's going to be a fixture. Yes, ma'am, Mary. Um, I think I just asked you. You answered your own question? I like those. Those are my favorite kind of questions. <laughs> we all okay on this? Okay, good, good. That second question is important. Make sure you remember it on a test. You know, they'll do things like, you know, Mrs. Smith's got a, a, a wooden bird feeder she nailed to the side of her house that she's been renting for the last six years. Okay, she nailed it to the side of the house, but who is she? Wow, hello. I don't know that was. She's a tenant, so it's personal property or real property? Personal. Personal. Okay, we all good with that? Good, good. Now, we talked about what an improvement was. It said an improvement is anything that humans do to a property in order to enhance its what? Value. Value. Any construction. I don't know what that is. I know it's the Bluetooth noise, but I don't know why it would be connecting and disconnecting. No, sorry. Um, so why, why this is important is if you get on the national section of the exam, and when you're on the exam, there's a national section and the state section, improvements are considered appurtenances. So like this building is an improvement, but it's also an appurtenance. That's why that word is so important. All right, that brings us to the next section. Now, let me see what time we've got here. I forgot my watch, it's killing me. Two o'clock. All right. So we're going to start this next section, and we're definitely not even going to come close to finishing it. We want to start this idea of estates. Up to this point, you all have enjoyed your time in the class. I am sorry to say that is about to end, because estates are miserable little gremlins that everybody hates by the time they finish this chapter. What I will tell you, though, you need to put an asterisk beside this in your notes. This is something that you will see on a final exam. And folks, by the time we get to a final exam, this is going to seem so far into the past that you are going to have forgotten all about it. So you really need to, because it's something we get into right on the first couple of days, you really need to put a reminder for yourself here, go back and study the estates section. First thing about it is, what is an estate? An estate, or that word estate, just means any legal relationship that we might have with a property. Any legal relationship. What is your legal relationship to the property? Well, what are the two most basic legal relationships somebody can have with a property? They either what? Own it or they lease it. Those are the two most basic types of estates. And that's exactly what we have on the next slide. The two most basic types of estates are leases or ownership. That's where this word freehold comes into play. The word freehold, second big vocabulary word of the day. First one was what? A pertinence. The second is freehold. A freehold estate or a freehold interest is an ownership interest. If you own the property, you have a freehold interest in the property. It doesn't mean anything deeper than that. It's just a vocabulary term. It's a fancy legal terminology. A freehold interest is an ownership interest. So anybody who owns the property has a freehold interest. Anybody who leases a property has a non-freehold interest. Leases are non-free. So the landlord would have what kind of an interest here? Freehold. freehold. The landlord would have a freehold because they own the property. The tenant would have a what? 
a non-freehold interest. This chart, I always love the first time I throw this chart up there, this little flow chart. That looks like it makes all the sense in the world, doesn't it? You're lying if you say it does. These are all of the different estates that you can have. Remember, what did we say the word estate means? Relationship. relationship. So these are all the different relationships that somebody can have with a piece of real estate. Sounds weird to say they're having a piece of uh, uh, a relationship with a piece of real estate, but that's the way it works. We have a relationship to these properties, and we said that we could break them down into ownership or freehold and, or and leasing or non-freehold. We want to talk about the ownership ones. We're going to talk about the leasing ones much later. That's chapter eleven. But for right now, we just want to talk about the estates of ownership or. The, the ownership interest, the different ways in which some, how many of you knew that there were different ways you could own property? There are lots of them. And we need to learn the differences between them. We need to learn what the differences are between these different types of ownership. So, when we start to break down the different types of ownership, let's talk about one that you know the best. Even though you didn't know you knew it, you did. It's called fee simple absolute. This is what you've always thought of as ownership. Let me ask you a question. If I own a property, what can I do with that property? Sell it. Sell it. it. Uh, there's the answer. Say that again, Devin. Whatever I want to do with it, right? It's mine. And how long do I own it? Forever. 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 That's fee simple absolute ownership. The type of ownership you're most familiar with is fee simple absolute ownership because it's ownership that doesn't have any restrictions on it. I own it because here are the two things that can be restricted about ownership. We can restrict the length of time you own something. We can put a timer on you. Or we can restrict what you can do with the property. If neither one are restricted, so you can do whatever you want, and you can do it for however long you want to. It's called fee simple absolute ownership. Who decides when I don't own this property anymore? You. I do. Sorry. I do. Not somebody else. There's no time clock ticking down. Who decides what I do with this property? You. I do. Nobody else told me what to do with this property. That is fee simple absolute ownership. This is the vast majority of ownership. If you own your own home, you own it fee simple absolute. I can almost certainly guarantee. Nine, probably 99.5% of all ownership is fee simple absolute. That's about all we're going to say about it because it doesn't require any further explanation. It's not limited in any way. There's no limit. What are the two things we said we could limit? Time, so how long we own the property, or what? use, what we're able to do with the property. And what are the limits with these simple absolute? No limits. Yes, sir, right. So you could have the fee simple absolute if you have the if you have a property where you have to have surveys, uh, zoning surveys and stuff, right? Great question. The answer is yes, you still have fee simple absolute. Because all of those restrictions are not part of the ownership. There are restrictions placed by some government agency. So when we say without restriction, we mean that the person who granted you ownership, the grantor, didn't place any restrictions on your ownership. The, the grantor didn't tell me how long I was going to own this property. And the grantor didn't tell me what I could do with this property. Now, there still might be restrictions. There might be government zoning restrictions. There might be covenants that limit what I can do. But it's still going to be considered fee simple absolute ownership. So like my house in Cary certainly has restrictions on it. But I still have fee simple absolute ownership because none of those restrictions came from the owner that sold it to me. Does everybody understand what he was asking? Okay. All right. So let's talk about the 0.5% of the time that you don't have fee simple absolute. Things that are less than fee simple absolute. What did I say the two things were that we could limit? Time, time or, use. or use. We're going to start with time. We're going to start with limiting time. 
the way you limit time is with something called a life estate. Okay? So we want to talk about life estates. And I'm going to skip ahead here in the slides for just a second. I will come back to those slides. But I'm going to skip ahead to this slide if you want to skip a couple ahead. I want to talk about limiting time. The grantor of a property, which is the owner of the property who's transferring ownership. Remember we said that earlier, right? We said a grantor is just somebody who is transferring ownership. The grantor of the property gets to decide what kind of ownership they want to transfer. They can decide to transfer fee simple absolute ownership, and which means they're doing what about restricting the ownership? What kind of restrictions are they placing if they if they give if they grant fee simple absolute? No. None. Well, that's not what's happening here. In the case of a life estate, the grantor wants to limit time. They want to limit the amount of time that this person is going to be able to own the property. So, Devin, I'm going to grant you ownership until you die. Now, I gave her the clock. The reason I gave her the clock is because she is something that we call the measuring life. The way we limit time is not by setting a deadline. We limit it based on somebody's lifetime. Are you with me on that? We limit it based on someone's lifetime. And that person is called the measuring life. So, the ownership is only going to last until Devin does what? Dies. Dies. That's why she's got the clock. Now, interestingly enough, she also has the property. We gave, we gave her ownership of the property. We gave her a deed. That's what we use to transfer ownership. So she has the deed. And that makes her what we call the life tenant. She is the owner of the property as well. Devin, you own it until you die. Is everybody with me on that? So she's actually playing two roles right here. She's the life tenant, and it says that's what? The owner, the owner of the property. So talk to her about an owner. What can an owner do? What can she do with the property? Sell it, lease it, whatever she Anything wants. Anything she wants. I didn't tell her what she could do with it. Her use is unlimited. Can she sell it? Yes. Yeah. Can she rent it out? Yes. Sure. Can she farm it? Yes. Can she live in it? Can, whatever she wants, it's hers. The only difference in this and Fee Simple Absolute is it's hers for a limited amount of time. And what is that limit on the amount of time? Her life. Her life. That's why it's called a life estate. The limit of time is her lifetime. Is everybody with me so far? She is not only the life tenant, but she is also the measuring life. Is everybody with me so far? She's the life tenant. She's the measuring life. Yes, sir, Freddie. So she's only selling a life estate. She can only sell what she owns. So let's take that to that next logical conclusion. She wants to sell the property. She does not want to own this thing. So. Here's her deed. This is her ownership of the property. This makes her the life tenant. Does that make sense to everybody? She's selling the property to Freddie. So she deeds the property. She grants the property over to Freddie. Now I want you to look at this setup now. Who owns the property? The guy her. Who gave her. Devin. Oh, Fred. Her. She sold it. She sold it. Okay. she sold it. Who owns it? Look where the deed is. Yeah. Who owns the property? Yeah. Freddie does. Why did she leave? <laughs> Tick tock. What didn't move with the sale? The measuring line. The clock stayed in the same place. Tick tock, Freddie. <laughs> How long does Freddie own that property? <laughs> Until Devin dies. Because the one thing that can never change about this life estate, folks, is where the clock is located. The clock stays right here. 
because the original grantor said so. Does that make sense for everybody? So yeah, Freddie owns it, but now Freddie owns it until what? Until Devin dies. Freddie owns it until Devin. What can Freddie do with the property? Whatever he wants to. Until until Devin can he sell it again? Did he sell it to Annie? Yeah. Sure. And then Annie would own it until until Devin dies. Because what would never change is where the clock is. That measuring life can never change. Because see, if the measuring life could never change, you could completely circumvent the whole limitation of time because you just keep selling it to a young person, right? <laughs> but the clock never changes. When she dies, when Devin dies, that ownership's going to go away. Poof. It evaporates. That's an important thing, would you say? Somewhere. Somewhere. That should be the next logical question. If you're actually turning this over in your brain, the next question you should ask is, well, where the hell does it go? Because the property doesn't disappear, right? The property doesn't disappear. The ownership might go away, but the property, somebody's got to own this thing. So, Devin has died. I'm so sorry. Turn the clock over. Okay, hanging black all over the mirrors. Devin's dead. Does Freddie own the property any longer? No. 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 We have to take his deed away. He is no longer the life tenant. Where do you think the property ownership is going to go? In the case of the one I set up, back to the original owner because I didn't say where it would go. I, all I said was this. Devin owns it until what? Until Devin dies. Now that changed to Freddie owns it until Devin dies because Devin decided to sell it. But since I never said where it was going, what, is the, what do you think the law assumes I meant for it to happen? Come right back to me. The original grantor. The original grantor. That's still back to me. See, that's why people struggle so much with life estates. They focus too much on that piece of it. It doesn't matter if I'm dead. It still comes back to me because I have what? I live on in the form of who? Heirs. My heirs. So if it comes back to me, that's still coming back to me even though I'm dead because who's going to get it? Heirs. My heirs. It comes right back to that original line of ownership. Does that make sense for everybody? That's called a reversionary interest. It reverts right back where it started. So let's go through the terms we've talked about so far. Devin owns it. That made her the what? Life tenant. Life tenant. Until Devin dies. That made her the what? Measuring life. The measuring life. And then it went back where? The original, the original, the original owner. owner, which is called a what kind of interest? A reversionary interest. It reverts back. Yes, sir, Brandon. Um, I do have no. Fred, so Brandon's question is: If I have no heirs, would Freddie get to keep the property? We all have an heir. We all have at least one. We are made. We are so looked after. We would never want to be left by ourselves. <laughs> the state of North Carolina is your heir if you have no others. <laughs> So it would go to the state of North Carolina. That's called a cheat when that happens. And it's spelled E-S cheat. C-H-E-A-T. And that's why it's called. Because they are cheating you out of your property. But yes, everybody has at least one heir at the end of the line. If they can't find one, they're like, oh my gosh, we looked so hard, we couldn't find it. Give it to us. You know, that's, a, that's the, how, how that process works. Now, I can make this a little bit different as the original grantor. I could say, for example, Kevin owns the property, so that makes him the what? Life the life what? Tenant. tenant. Kevin, I'm granting you ownership of the property until Aaliyah dies. So right out of the gate, we're a little bit different this way, aren't we? Kevin is the life tenant, but who's the measuring life? Aaliyah. Aaliyah. That works just as well. Kevin, I'm granting you ownership until Aaliyah dies, and then it goes to Bryson. 
Now, who owns the property? Kevin. Kevin. What can he do with it? Everything, Everything and anything he wants to do with it. No problem. Can he sell it? Yes. Sure, he can sell it. Sell it to Jeannie. Jenny or Jeannie? Jenny. So he sells it to Jenny. She's now the life tenant. How long does she own it? Until Aaliyah dies. Until Aaliyah dies. Notice what never moves, that clock. That clock stays in the same place. So now Jenny owns it until Aaliyah dies, and it's still going to go once Aaliyah dies, where? To Bryson over here. Everybody with me? So talk to me. Jenny's called the what? Life tenant, because she owns the property. Aaliyah's called the what? Measuring life. Measuring life. What is Bryson called? He's called the remainder man or remainder interest. So if the original grantor specifies where it's going to go, we call that a remainder interest. If the original grantor just sort of leaves it fill in the blank, it's called a reversionary interest. It comes back. It reverts back. Is everybody following on that? Okay. So label them real quickly for me. Jackie owns the property. Jackie owns the property until Bo dies and then it goes to Catherine. What's Jackie? Life tenant. Life tenant. What's Bo? Measuring life. Measuring life. And then it goes to Catherine. What is she? Remainder, remainder. remainder interest. Now here's a real good question for you. What kind of ownership is Catherine going to have when it gets to her? Fee simple. Fee simple absolute. absolute. Because the only restriction that was placed on the ownership was a time restriction. And that time restriction has now what? Expired, gone away. So Catherine gets the ownership completely unrestricted. Does that make sense for everybody? So Catherine, by the way, in case you're keeping score, Jackie is Bo's best friend. Because if Bo is in the hospital, Jackie is bringing him chicken soup, folks. Because her ownership only lasts until he does what? Dies. Until he dies. Meanwhile, you better watch Kathy and make sure she's not pulling any plugs. Because she's going to be looking around the corner. No, nah, he's done. I saw the thing go flat, right? And I, because her ownership takes over the instant that that measuring life passes away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So the, remain, the remainder man option is basically um, shifting that ownership from the grantor to somebody else with a with a stop in between. So let me let me give you a real world. So do you need something practical to understand why the hell somebody would do something like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. because you see, I mean, if you hear it, and you're like, hey, I don't get it. I don't get it. So I'll give it to you, and here's how I can give it to you. My grandfather had one of these. I lived through a life estate. My grandfather, who's now passed away, been been passed away for a little over ten years, was a farmer in eastern North Carolina. When he was a very young man in his 20s, the people who owned the farm next door to him were an older couple who had no children. They didn't have heirs. They just didn't have anybody. They became very ill and unable to take care of their own farm. My grandfather um, basically looked after their farm for them. Um, he took care of the farm. He took care of them. He took them to doctor's appointments. This was in the 40s. This was a long time ago. When they died, they left him their farm as a life estate. They had always intended to leave the farm to the Children's Home of North Carolina. That was their favorite charity. That's who they had chosen because they had no children. They had chosen they wanted to leave their farm to the Children's Home of North Carolina. But as they aged and they had this young man taking care of them, they felt like they should reward him for taking care of them. So they left the farm to him for what? His lifetime. And they named the children's home of North Carolina as the what? As the remainder interest. So my grandfather was given a life estate in the farm. 
he owned the farm until he what? Until he died. And then the farm went to the children's home of North Carolina. So when I was a child, I just thought our farm was really big. I didn't realize it was two farms, and one of them was ours, and one of them really was. I didn't know that until I was much older. And that's exactly what happened as soon as my grandfather, now my grandfather he got that life estate when he was 28 years old. He lived to be 84. So it was a very long life estate. But the moment he passed away, ownership of that farm went from him to who? The children's home of North Carolina. And of course, they immediately sold the property and took the proceeds because they don't want to own a farm in eastern North Carolina. But for my grandfather's entire life, there was a brick house on the property. He rented it out. Who got the rental proceeds? He did. He did. He farmed the farm. Who got the money from farming the land? He did. Who got the money from cutting the timber? He did. He did. Because it belonged to him for his entire life. He was the what? What roles was he playing? He was the life tenant, and he was also the what? Measuring the life. measuring life, and then the children's home of North Carolina was the, the remainder interest. Does that make sense? Yeah, and all of y'all got mad. Yeah, well, we all actually, you know, we all uh, we all knew what the deal was, you know. And, uh, and my, my mom and her sister always knew what the deal was. You know, of course, I realized it as as I was older, but. You know, what a great thing for them to do because it allowed them to essentially leave it to the charity that they wanted to and also reward, um, you know, the person that they wanted to reward. Yes, sir. So let's say that I'm going to purchase a property. It's disclosed, I would think, in the courts that it's a life estate. Correct. Okay. Yes, it would. If that was the end of the question, then yes, that would absolutely be made clear. When you went down and you did what we call a title search okay. at the county courthouse, you're going to clearly see that the person you are purchasing from only has a life estate in the property. Because if you don't and buy that, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you just <laughs> bought time. That's right. You'd be really upset. Really upset. Yes, sir, Francisco. Uh, what happened in the sample that was in North Carolina children house nonprofit? Did not exist. In that case, it would have gone to the state of North Carolina because just like the state is the last heir for people who don't have heirs, it's the last stop for charities that cease to exist and that sort of thing. Yeah, it would have gone to the state of North Carolina and into the general fund. They always get it in the end. Yes, sir. So say that your uh, your grandfather put say like a building he supplies in and maybe uh, started another little on the land mm -hmm. or whatever that land was turned over. All of that is part of the property. So any attachments you make to the property would convey to the remainder interest. So that'd be something you'd have to be aware of if making improvements on that property. You know? well, so really you're 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 doing it as a it, it's a gamble against time. You know that's the thing with life estates. Life estates can last for a really long time or a really short amount of time. Yes sir. Um, if, so if you were the grandfather you gave someone the measure of what can you, are you able to take that back? You cannot. Once you have put this in motion, you cannot take it back um, because you no longer have ownership. You can't change what you don't own any longer. So his question was basically, if I'm the grantor and I've put this thing in motion and I've named someone as the measuring life, can I step back in and meddle with it and change it? And the answer is no. Because once you've signed over ownership, you don't have the legal right any longer. The ownership is passed to you. And so you can't come back in and change it. You have to let it run its course. Whatever that might be. Yes, ma'am. Um, stemming off of Bryson, whenever if there is like a business on the land and you have to give it to someone else, you'd have to sell that business to them too. Well, the, the any real property would automatically convey to them. You don't have to sell the business to them, but you have to vacate the property. Right. Okay. And any improvements that you've made on the property would belong to them. So like in, the, in case of my granddad, the only improvements that I'm aware of that he had made on the property were fencing because he used part of the property to fence his cows in on the back part of the property. Yeah, I grew up like that. Uh, we had chickens and cows and hogs. And, um, and so um, the, we used the back part of that property, really wasn't good farmland, so we used it as part of the cow pasture. And uh, we had put fencing up back there. Of course, that fencing just becomes property of the, the new owner when that happens. I see it on the other hand, or we, is everybody good? We, is this kind of okay for you? Life estates tend to be one of those things that throw people for a little bit of a loop. They're not quite as bad as they may seem. Now, 
Now that you understand the terminology, let's talk about the difference. Let's talk about the difference between a conventional life estate and a life estate for ultra V. There's nothing new here. All this means is conventional life estates are one where the measuring life and the life tenant are the same person. So my grandfather's life estate was a what? A conventional life estate because my grandfather was the life tenant and my grandfather was also the measuring life. Whenever they are the same person, we call that a conventional life estate. One of the interesting things about conventional life estates is it's the only ownership that's not inheritable. It's the only time you can own property and that ownership not be inheritable. Think about my grandfather's life estate. He owned it till he died. Well, my mom and her sister inherited everything my grandfather owned, including the farm that was our family farm in Edgecombe County. When would they have inherited this other farm from him if they could have? When he what? When he died. But what happened to the ownership the moment he died? It went away. It went to somebody else. So he can't leave it as an inheritance because the instant he dies, he no longer what? He no longer owns it. Does that make sense for everybody? So a conventional life estate, this might show up on a test. I would put a star beside this little note. A conventional life estate is not inheritable. It's the only type of ownership that isn't inheritable. Every other ownership that we talk about is inheritable. Now the other type of life estate is the poor ultra V. If conventional meant the life tenant and the measuring life were the same person, what do you think poor ultra V is going to be? They are what? Different people. Notice we set it up both ways in our examples, right? Sometimes we said, we said Devin owned it until Devin died. Well, that was a conventional life estate. And then we said that Kevin owned it until Aaliyah died. Well, that was a life estate for ultra V. Because anytime the measuring life and the life tenant are two different people, that just means it's poor ultra V. Is everybody okay with that? It's just the way we describe it. Doesn't change the way it's structured at all. Doesn't change anything about the reversionary interest. Doesn't change anything about the remainder interest. Those all stay the same. It's just if the measuring life and the life tenant are the same person, it's what? Conventional. If the measuring life and the life tenant are different people, it is? It's poor ultra V. All right, so I want you to help identify this one. Okay, everybody listen up. Francisco owns the property until Claire dies, at which point in time it will go to Annie. I'm going to repeat that. Francisco will own the property until Claire dies, at that point in time it will go to Annie. What kind of life estate do we have? First of all, is it conventional or is it poor ultra v? Poor v. It's poor ultra v because the life tenant and the measuring life are what? Two different people. And does it have a remainder interest or does it have a reversionary interest? It has a what? Remainder. Because I said it would go to Annie. Reversionary would mean it would come back where? To the original grantor, which is me in this case. It would come back to me, not Francisco. Francisco owns it till Claire dies and then it goes to Annie. Or Francisco owns it till Claire dies. Francisco owns it till Claire dies. That's a life estate poor ultra V with a reversionary interest. I didn't say where it would go, so where's it going to go? Back to me. It reverts back to me. If I say where it goes in the end, what kind of interest is that? That's a remainder interest. Jackie owns it until Jackie dies. What is that? Conventional, but you are only halfway there. You got to tell me whether it's reversionary or remainder. Is that conventional reversionary or conventional remainder? Reversionary. reversionary. You know it's going to revert back to me because I didn't say what? I didn't say where it's going afterward. Does that make sense? Bo owns the property until Freddie dies. And there is a provision that states that future ownership will end up with Kevin. 
What kind of life estate do we have? Remainder. For ultra V, with a remainder or a reversionary? Remainder interest. With a remainder interest. Because that provision, that future ownership win with Kevin, means the thing is going to go to where? Yeah. Kevin and not revert back to me. Does everybody see those? You need to work with those in your brain. Make sure you get that etched into your mind. And that's going to be our first stopping point for today. All right? So I will see you guys tomorrow, and we will continue Chapter 2 and then roll into Chapter 3 tomorrow. Have a good one, guys. Okay, let me go stop the video. I'll be right back. Come back here and I'll answer back here. Either way.